Good morning, everyone. This is Frank Liu. Welcome back to Finet One Two Two One Introduction to Finance Week Seven Lecture. I hope you had a relaxing non-teaching break and not feeling overly isolated from the rest of the world. Today is our first attempt on getting a bit more understanding about the financial world. I'll be talking about how to value equity instrument, or simply put, how do we price a company's share. This is our first attempt. And I hope it will encourage you to keep going further and discovering more about the share market. The recommended rating is Chapter Seven: Share Valuation, the Discount, the Dividend Discount Model. You may notice that Chapter Ten also covers share valuation. That is the second installment of the series. However, we are not covering it in this unit. Chapter Ten will be a self-rating, and its content will not be examinable. After we finish capital budgeting in week nine, I will briefly discuss the additional models in week ten before we talk about risk and return in capital market. Anyway, the focus of this unit is on chapter seven. There are five tutorial questions, and MFL test seven is due on Friday, eighth of eighth eighth of May, twenty twenty. You may note that、uh, test five and test six have their extensions. And test five is due on Monday today, twentieth of April, and test six is due this Friday, twenty fourth of April. The main learning objectives in week seven are as follows. First of all, we need to describe the basics of ordinary shares, preference shares, and share quote. We can value a share as the present value of expected future dividends. Want to understand the trade-off between dividends and growth in share valuation? We'd also want to appreciate the limitations of valuing a share based on expected dividends. And at the end, we're going to study our second model, which is total payout model, in which we will value a share as the present value of the company's total payout. So the lecture will be divided into two parts: the dividend discount model. And an extension of that, which is the total payout model. When people talk about share market, you often hear the, the term "bulls and bears." So both terms relate to the overall expectation on share valuations. Though for the past couple of months, it has become extremely difficult for one to communicate with each other over these terms, as some say the market has become much more unexplainable and more detached from the underlying economy. Feel free to Google the definition for bull and bear market. Yong Tai. All right, so let's come back to this central、uh, formula that we have talked about before. So you may recall that in week three, Daniel went through the equality sign, which is why do we care about the present value? Why do we care about cash flows? And why do we think that the present value on the left hand side equals to the right hand side? The cash flow divided by one plus interest pound to n, and in week four we went through a few special cases of when you have one cash flow versus you have multiple cash flows, and cash flows follow a pattern like annuity perpetuity, annuity with constant growth, and so on and so on. And then in week five we talk about the interest rate. So how do you express interest rate, and what happens when you have、uh, inflation, real interest rate? And then after we've studied this formula, we has we we learn the first application, which is valuing bonds. And valuing bonds seems to be a very、um, intuitive extension to study this、uh, equation. Why? Because in the bonds scenario, all the cash flows are determined. So which means if you think about a typical coupon paying bond, the term structure, the,、uh, the term specified on a bond will tell you that, for example, you will receive coupon in six months time, twelve months time, you will get a face value of a seven dollars in ten years time. So all the cash flows are predetermined, and then the pr the price can be just think, can be sort of as the discounted、uh, cash flows add up together. And our second application is on valuing stocks. So you may say that how will share pricing link to this simple equation? Well, we will see. Market participants spend a lot of time and effort into share valuation, but this could be investors who are looking for mis、um, profiting from mispricing, 
It could also be sales side analysts who provide such valuation series for their clients on potential mergers and acquisitions. So let's give you give you a few examples. So you know you may be a frequent subscribers to uh, frequent readers of Australian Financial Review. So here you have you know you you have all the news coverage on the market side. You can also get the news from Wall Street Journal. And you can also get it from Thomson Reuters Icon that, uh, that we subscribe to in the business school. And you can also get all the news from Bloomberg. People spend a lot of time on studying the market, gathering the latest news, right? So yeah, the sum of the headlines is quite eye-catching. Analysts can't explain why Liberty Trip Advisor shares jumped 944%, right? So all that has to do with share valuation. So it is not entirely crazy to say most investors are looking for a way to consistently beat the market. The rule is simple. You want to buy low and sell high, or sell high and then buy low. In other words, the idea is to find something that is relatively cheaper than you should be, buy it, and then sell it when the price converges to what you should be. But how does one come up with such valuation? It is safe to say no such model exists, or not just yet. Maybe never, because empirically we haven't witnessed a single investor who has consistently, I mean consistently, not just over one year, not two years, not 10 years, but consistently outperformed the market. You may have read that God like Warren Buffett just made a $5 billion loss from selling down his holdings in Southwest Airlines and Delta Airlines. So anyone could be wrong with their original models. So what we're doing here is that we will look at a variety of models and approaches that theoretically should give the same answer. But of course, all models are based on assumptions. And so what we are really hoping is that our models give us a common range of values. In other words, we are not trying to make a point forecast here relying on a single model. Rather, it is better to use a variety of models with varying assumptions to arrive at a range of forecast. And most investors are competing with how narrow the range is and whether the true price falls in their range. We start with getting through some share basics. There are two main types of shares, ordinary shares and preference shares. So when we talk about share price movements of a company, people buying and selling shares in the share market, we generally assume the context is in trading ordinary shares. They are the most commonly traded across all share markets. So what's the definition? An ordinary share means that a share of ownership in a company which gives its owner's right to any ordinary dividends as well as the right to vote on the election of directors and on major events such as mergers. So a, a share is also known by its ticker symbol is a unique abbreviation assigned to a publicly traded company and used when its trades are reported on a ticker, which is a real-time electronic display of a trading activity. All right, on this slide, we have a share price quote for JB Hi-Fi, JBH. That's the ticker symbol for JB Hi-Fi. Some, some of you may know that JB Hi-Fi was a small family store that started in um, Victoria. So, on this screen, what we have here is this share price movement from June 2016 to December 2016, All right? So there's a couple of very interesting information about JB Hi-Fi over here. First of all, is that it tells you that the share is actually listed on ASX, Australian Stock Exchange. And there's a, there's a quote over here saying ASX de data delayed by 20 minutes. That's because here we're using the free service by provided by Google Finance. And if you want to get the, the real-time um, information about JB Hi-Fi, you must, you must pay the subscription fee to the data fee through your broker. And it shows that, well, the price range for JB Hi-Fi over the past 52 weeks was the lowest 17.36 to about the highest at 31.14. And the close price on December 9th was 26.14. 0.17, which is 1.28% down from the previous day. And JB Hi-Fi, the latest, uh, the last dividend payment was 37 cent, which back then was yielded at 33.77% dividend yield. 
and um, the market cap back then was about 2.99 billion dollars all right all shareholders have the right to attend the annual meetings and to cast their votes directly but in practice most either allow the board to vote for them or direct that the shares be voted for them via proxy which is an act through which shareholders direct that their shares be voted for them or they can provide give explicit instructions on how they should be voted so in the annual general meetings is an event which managers and directors answer questions from shareholders and shareholders vote on election of directors and other proposals so the typical matters at the general meetings are uncontested but occasionally there are dramatic proposals from a shareholder group either by inserting a new director removing a, removing an existing director or opposing a proposal from management in such case each side of the action will actively solicit the proxies of all shareholders so that they may win the vote in a way that was known as a proxy contest. Preference shares is the second major type of shares, also known as preferred stocks, so preferred shares. Not all companies issue preference shares these days, in, and not all companies issue preference shares in your initial public offering. So what are they? As the name suggests, the preference shareholders have preference over ordinary shares in the distribution of dividends or cash during liquidation. So when board, board of directors choose to pay out dividends, cash dividends, they have to pay the preference share first, they have to pay the preference shareholders first, make sure they, they're happy, before they can pay a dividend to ordinary shareholders. But on the downside, preference shareholders do not have any voting rights, like what the ordinary shareholders typically do. So in a way, preference shares are similar to bonds in that preference shares provide regular and defined income payments and generally have a fixed maturity date. At its maturity, they are either converted into a lump sum cash payment like the face value of a bond or be converted into ordinary shares at a discount. This is why they are also known as a hybrid, a hybrid instrument. To be more specific, we have cumulative and non-cumulated pre, uh, preferred shares. So cumulated preference shares means that any unpaid dividends are carried forward. Non-cumulated preference shares means that missed dividends do not accumulate and the firm can pay current dividend payment first to preference and then to ordinary shareholders. Now let's have a look at our dividend discount model. So in what follows, we'll make a number of assumptions. You can think of that how we're gonna price a company's shares is based on the present value of the following. So we can looking at the present value of dividend payments to determine the stock price and the present value of all payout, dividends and repurchases to determine the equity value. And what's gonna be covered in chapter 10 is the free cash flow, which means we're gonna evaluate a company based on the present value of all its future cash flows, which are available to pay both equity holders as well as debt holders, which determines the enterprise value. But we're not gonna cover that in this unit, so feel free to read it later on. All right, so let's have a look at our, this uh, very basic model, dividend discount model. So in what follows, we're gonna make quite a, quite a number of assumptions, but let's first assume that we are an investor who has one year investment horizon for the share. There are two potential sources of cash flows coming from only a share. So the firm may pay out a cash dividends to shareholders in the form of dividends. Also, the, sh the investor may generate cash by selling the shares at some future date. Let dividend one here, div one, be the total dividends the investor expect to be paid per share during a year. To make things easier, let's just assume all dividends are paid at the end of the year. So at the end of the first period, year one. Also at the end of the year, the investor will sell the share at the new market price. Let's say P1. Why? Because think about this, we are evaluating this from a one year investor's point of view. 
So the investment horizon is over a year. So we have the following timeline for this investment. So at time zero, you make a payment of P0 price. At time one, you will get dividend one and price one. Since the cash flows here are risky because we don't know what dividend one is going to be, we don't know what the price is going to, going to be turned out. So here, we coming from a point of view that we're assuming the investor expecting the dividend one is going to be X dollars, P1 is going to be Y dollars. And given these cash flows are risky because that may not turn out to be the, uh, to the actual amount. So unlike in bond study where when a coupon paying bond tells you you're going to get a coupon payment of $50 per, coup, per, uh, per bond, that means that number is fixed. But over here, none of these numbers is fixed. So these cash flows are risky. So we must discount them at the equity cost of capital, RE. So required rate of return from the equity point of view, RE, is the rate that investors want for investment in this risky class. So in um, if you keep if you do if you're doing finance major when you're doing finite two 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 corporate financial policy, uh, you have a few weeks devoted to learn how to come up with the um, discount rate for the company using weighted average cost of capital. But for here, you can just think about we can't use the normal interest rate, the risk free interest rate, because here where there's a risk involved, the company may not pay you dividends. So we're just gonna use a new discount rate called required rate of return, RE. Just to give you an example, when we say share, uh, share prices can be extremely volatile, and this is a very risky investment, let's take a look at SurfStitch. Some of you may know this brand. And um, so back when you were still trading in the share market, there was some crazy movement before it was delisted. For example, over here in this, this news covered, um, shares in the form of market darling plunged 54% on Tuesday. You wouldn't want to be the sh you wouldn't want to be the shareholder back then, and you would wouldn't want to be a shareholder today, because it's no longer traded in the market. So let's take a look at this slide with some formulas over here. So for a one-year investor's point of view, the price is equal to the present value of the dividend they're gonna receive plus the share price they expect it to be at the end of the year, discounted by the required rate of return for equity. So the idea here is that they will use their own assumptions, come up with this P0, and they will then compare the P0 with the current stock price. If the current stock price is less than this amount, they would expect investors to think, okay, my model suggests the current price should be 50, but rather the actual current price is, 40, is, uh, is 48. That just means that the current stock price is undervalued. They expect investors to rush in and buy it, drive up the stock price and vice versa. But of course, dividend and price are uncertain. We don't know what dividend one is. We don't know what P1 is. And RE is, is, an, is just an estimate. But why is it important to start from such basics? All right, let's, let's just draw the timeline out. So over here, we have zero, one time point. And at time zero, we've made a price P0. And at time one, we assume that, assume, let's just make an ass uh, assumption. We assume we're gonna get P1, and we assume we're gonna get dividend one, right? We don't know what that is. But, and let's just say the interest, the uh, time value of money for an investor in this, uh, asset class is RE, E for equity. So what I'm saying here is that they think the price should be the present value of its future payment, P1 and D1. In this case, that will be P1 plus D1 divided by 1 plus RE. So that may look familiar to you now because that involves discounting cash flows for the future. But I just want to make sure that you know that we don't know what, in real life, we don't know what P1 is and we don't know what D1 is. But what does this formula um, review? Well, if you take a look, if you rearrange this formula, so here we have, we move one plus IE to the left hand side and P0 to the right hand side. What we have here is this. And that means RE can be written as rewritten as P1 over P0 plus D1 over P0 
minus 1. And that can be rewritten as d1 over p0 plus p1 minus p0 over p0. If, if you just bring the minus 1 to the, uh, the top of the fraction. So what we have here is that we can think about the required rate of, required rate of return of, on equity is a, is, um, consists of two components. First of all, this is known as dividend yield. Secondly, this second component is known as capital gain rate. Which means what investor expecting to get as a return can be sort of, well, there are two incomes. I'm going to get a dividend. I'm going to be able to sell the shares, hopefully, at a higher price. Such that my return come, coming from the dividend yield and the capital gain rate. So the dividend yield is just a percentage return the investor expects to earn from the dividend paid by the share. And the capital gain here is the difference between the expected sale price and the original purchase price, P0, over the P0. That's the return. And the whole term here, this whole term here is called total return. Which is the sum of dividend yield and capital gain rate. So the total return should be the same as the expected return the investor will earn for a one-year investment in the share. This should be equal. All right. So here are the definitions for these new terms, dividend yield, capital gain, and total return. And this slide just derives what we just um, show you on the, on the iPad. So here, let's look at this example. Suppose you expect Benson Toys to pay an annual dividend of 56 cents per share in the coming year and to trade 45.50 per share at the end of the year. So that's what you're expecting, of course, because no one knows that for sure. Um, if investment with equivalent risk to Benson's shares have an expected return of 6.8%, so see this, uh, this whole statement here is really saying what your discount rate is 6.8%. It's not a risk free rate, not a rate that a bank will give you. And because here we're, we're dealing with something that's risky, right? Think about surf stage. Um, so what is the most you pay today for one Benson's share based on your own expectation? And what is the dividend yield and capital gain rate would you expect at this price? So here we have a few numbers to deal with. We are given your expected dividend amount which is 56 cents we are given your expected share price which is 45.50 we are given the time value of money required rate of return on equity is 6.8 percent so we can the, the rest just to use the formula so here p0 equals to div1 plus p1 over 1 plus re and if you believe the math the p0 is 43.13 and then we can work out the individual component and to, um, to decompose what the RE here is. So what is the dividend yield? The dividend yield here is, remember, dividend yield is dividend amount divided by the initial price, which is 1.3% here. The expected capital gain is about $2.37 per share, or if you divide it by the initial price, P0, that gives about 5.5%. And if you take a close look, adding 1.3% and 5.5% together, you will get 6.8%, which is the same as your required rate of return on equity. And that's not just a, that, that's not a magic, that's just a uh, rearrangement, really. So let's just say, what if you say a one-year investor assumption is too naive? Let's just say, how about we're moving on for two years? So what is the price if we plan on holding the stock for two years? Well, the starting point here is that we now assuming we expect the dividend at in time one to be D1. D1. Uh, at the end of year two, we're gonna get D2 and plus P2. So you may, some of you may say, oh geez, what if the company does not pay dividend? Does that mean we have to assume you're paying dividend? No, so here remember this, everything is in symbolic forms. 
So D1 here could be zero, D2 here could be zero, um, but of course they can't pay you negative, negative dividend, right? So here in this case, if we understand uh, our previous de derivation, now the P0 can be written as the discount value of future cash flows using our required rate of return for equity. So in this case, in time one, we're get, gonna get D1. So that means discount value of that is D1 divided by one plus RE. In year two, we're gonna get D2 plus B2, which is discounted back for two periods is one over RE squared. So th does this suggest a two-year investor will value the shares differently than a one-year investor? That does that mean now we're making an assumption that we are talking about a two-year uh, two horizon? Does it mean that the share price should be different? Well, you could say that a one-year investor does not care about the dividend and share price in year two directly, but investors care about them indirectly in a way that they will affect the price for which the share can be sold at the end of the year one. All right, that's just looking at, uh, going back to this writing again. So let's just take a, take, a, take a look at this. Let's just say here we have another one year, another one year investor at the end of year one. So what we have previously is that we know that the P1 equals to the next dividend payment plus what they expect to sell at the end of year two divided by one plus RE. So which means that in this case, for that one year investor, what he what they indirectly assuming is this. D1 plus P1 over one plus RE and substitute that P1 in here. And what they have here is that that becomes D1 over one plus RE plus one plus RE one plus IE times D2 plus P2 over one plus RE. And that is, remember this is the P1 here coming from this formula. And that means you can keep writing, expanding it out. It becomes this, which is the same as what we have over there for a two year uh, horizon investor. So which means that we can really now extend our model to cover a multi-year investor. Let's just say we plan on holding the stock for n years and can be any number greater than one. So here we can we can think about the price. It's gonna be a sum of discounted dividends in the future up until year n, up until the end of the period I decided to hold for, plus the price at the end, at the end over one plus r e power to n. And this for this model over here, this long, um, this long summation of discounted part is known as dividend discount model. You can, you can see how this model is named because it's discounting the dividends plus an end value. Right? Know that the above equation holds for any horizon n, so all investors with the same beliefs will attach the same value to the stock independent of the investment horizons. And you, you, and you may think, still think that, oh, this is quite naive. We're going to make a lot of assumptions. Yes, remember, we are making assumptions. Like every other great models, we're going to start making, we start from making assumptions. And then we can, and, and, and that's see what that, what those assumptions can, can lead us to, to see any of those real implications for empirical findings. So the dividend discount model, the general formula is what you have on top of this, um, uh, in the top panel in this table. So what we're gonna later on to show you is to derive two special cases. The first case is where we're gonna start assuming the dividend actually grows. It grows by an amount of G percent every year. And we can also make an extension to that assumption to say, okay, well, let's just relax some of the assumptions saying it's unrealistic to assume the dividend start growing from year one. Let's just say the dividend will start growing after certain years, but we'll, but we'll go to that point. 
So for the special case in which the firm eventually pays out dividends and is never acquired by another company or never filed bankruptcy, then it is possible to hold the shares forever through generations of generations. And in this scenario, rather than having a stopping point of PN, rather than having a, st a stopping point where it eventually sell the shares, you can rewrite a previous equation into this, which is you can think about the share price is equal to the present value of all the expected future dividends that you will pay. And that captures the nature of the share to a shareholder, which means you can think about a share is a claim to all the future profit generated by the company forever. But of course, estimating dividend one is hard, estimating dividend two is hard, and estimating dividend n or dividend n plus one, dividend infinity is extremely difficult. So remember here, we're trying to come out with a simple model, trying to make a lot of assumptions, come out with a simple model to see whether that it captures the nature of what we see empirically, all right? So a common used approximation is to assume that in the long run, the dividend will start growing at a constant rate. So here let's just say, we will say that dividend start will, will start growing at a constant rate G from year one. So what we have here is that in year one, we're gonna get dividend one. And after that, because the, now the firm matures, the dividend will grow at a rate of G percent, which is one plus G. And after that, in year three, that will be one plus G squared more than dividend one. So you can think about how that is linked to what we learned in, year two, in week four about the perpetuity. So by making this assumption that the future dividends will grow at a constant rate G, we arrive at this very powerful formula, P0 equals to D1 divided by I minus G. And let's see what, is, what this formula reveals to us. Right, so P0 equals to D1 over RE minus G. If you rearrange it, what you have here is RE minus G equals to D1 divided by P0, RE equals to D1 over P0 plus G. So remember here, what we previously showed that is RE here is the total return. That is should be the same as the dividend yield plus the capital gain rate. And if you compare to that, Compare that with this formula over here. This is the dividend yield. Given this is the total return, that means the G here captures the capital gain. So what drives the capital gain is the expected growth rate of the dividend. Let's take us to, to the next line. That we can see that G here equals the expected capital gain rate with constant expected dividend growth model. The expected growth rate of the share price matches the growth rate of the dividends. Now let's have a look at an example. So here AT&T pl plans to pay $1.44 per share in individuals in the coming year. Its equity cost of capital, RE here is 8%. Dividends are expected to grow by 4% per year in the future, starting from year one, and um, estimated value of AT&T stock. So, I mean, the answer is here, but it's very important to, to note that what we are dealing with. So AT&T plans to pay $1.44 per share in dividends in the coming year, which means they haven't paid that yet. So that means that $1.44 is the one is what's gonna, what you expect to receive by the end of the year. So the D1 here is $1.44. IE here 8%, growth rate 4%. That means you estimate the value of the AT&T stock based on these assumptions is $36. You can see the importance of the, uh, of the number G here because the G really captures the capital gains rate. So how do we actually come up with a reasonable assumption for what G should be? Well, before that, we need to, we need to introduce a few, a few new concepts. The first one is the dividend payout ratio. So remember that the dividend is determined by the board of directors 
and is paid out as a fraction of earnings. So here we can think about dividends coming from earnings. So dividend per share coming from earnings per share. Earnings is your profit. Earnings per share multiplied by dividend payout rate. So, the, so if the dividend payout rate is 100%, that means 100% of the earnings pay out as dividends. If dividend payout rate is 0%, that means the company is not going to pay out any dividends. So dividend payout rate it can be also think of as 1 minus retention rate, which means that whatever is not paid out as dividend, you'll be retained in the company for future growing opportunities. Right? So the retention rate over here plus payout rate equals to 1. So all, alternatively, you can define it as retention rate equals to 1 minus the dividend payout ratio. So you can think about, based on that, my formula, dividend equals to earnings per share times dividend payout rate, the firm can increase its dividend in really three ways. It can increase its earnings, so it makes the earnings bigger. That means holding everything else constant, making a bigger earnings, Having a bigger earnings, more profit, you will increase the dividend amount. Or you can increase the dividend payout rate, which means you can pay more out from the earnings. You can also decrease the number of shares outstanding by doing a share repurchasing, right? Per repurchasing all the outstanding shares from the market. We'll be focusing on the first two over here, right? Increases earnings or in increases dividend payout rate. Let's have a look at an example before we start uh, deriving what, what the growth rate should be. So NAP pays dividends six monthly and plans to pay 90 cents per share in dividends in six months. So the, here we're dealing with a company that pays dividends every six months, uh, which is not exactly rare these days. Dividends are expected to grow by 4% per year in the future, expre expressed as an uh, effective annual rate. And the discount rate for NAP is 10% per year, EAR, and estimate the value of NAP stock. So calculate the discount and growth rate for six for a six month period. So the next six so the next dividend payment is going to be ninety cents per share, and it's due in nine months, six months. Sorry. So plans to pay ninety cents per share in dividend in six months. That just means that. Let's just using what we have here. For NAP. 0, 1, 2, and so on, so on. So here, remember, this is six months period. So because it's saying it plans to pay out uh, 90 cents per share, that means it hasn't done so. So that means here, the first dividend is gonna be 90 cents. And the second one is gonna be D1 times one plus G. And the third one is gonna be D1 times one plus G squared. We just need to work out what a G here is. Given that dividends are expected to grow by 4% per year, so which means the growth rate per six months will be this. One plus the growth rate for two six months equals to one plus 0 0.04 power to one. Right, even though this is not interest rate, but remember here, everything is expressed in EAR. So that means the G here will be, because G here is for six months, so if you compound it for two six month period, you'll be 4%. So that means G here will be 1.04 power to a half minus one, which is 1.98%. And the discount rate RE is 10% per year. So that means the same thing goes one plus RE for two six month period equals to one plus one 1 plus uh, 0 0.1 power to 1. So that means RE here equals to 1.1 power to a half minus 1 or 4.881% based on these numbers G, RE, and then D1. We can just go straight to applying the formula P0 equals to D1 divided by RE minus G equals to 90 cent divided by 0 0.04881 minus 0 0.0198 and that gives you $31.03. We're not saying this is, the, this is the true price for NAP. This price is only valid if this assumption is hold, right? 
So which means based on these assumptions, we, we arrive at the price should be $31.03. And now let's, now let's have a look at how do, we, how do we come up with a reasonable assumption for growth rate? Oh, here's a weekly game trivia. So we'll talk about that after this. So what time in Sydney time can you start trading Telstra shares on ASX? I don't know why I keep on saying that's, that's Tesla. Telstra shares on ASX on a normal weekday. So we've been, to we've been talking about shares, share valuation this week. But when you say think about buying, selling shares, do you think that's a 24-7 activity? So here we know that we can't buy and sell shares on, over the weekend, but on, on a weekday, what time can you start buying Telstra shares? Have a guess. Oh, we're talking about senior time, of course. Well, you can Google it, and if you don't want to Google it, you can just keep uh, reading, keep, keep watching the video. So here, as specified by ASX, uh, they have a number of uh, phases on a typical trading day. So between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. is the pre-open phase, and at 10 a.m. the market opens. So which means if your answer was you can start trading Telstra shares around 10 a.m., that's close. That's very close to the actual answer. But when I'm saying act uh, very very close to that, it's because that's not the actual answer. Because what makes things complicated is that. On ASX, this is quite unique, right? Um, uh, I think ASX is probably one of the only few share markets that still apply this. So what I do here is that they uh, they divide all the shares into five groups based on the first letter alphabetically. So which means in this case, the group one will start from 10 a.m. plus or minus 15 seconds if your first letter start with zero to, between zero and nine or A to B. Group two, 10 o'clock, two minutes and 15 seconds, plus or minus 15. Group three, group four, and group five. So if you are Telstra, which group would that be? Well, group five. And, but do you know the exact time every day? No, you don't. Because here, even though it's 10 o'clock, nine minutes a.m. but it's going to be plus minus 15 seconds and this time is randomly generated every day so which means it could have been 10 o'clock eight minutes and 52 seconds or it could have been on, a, on, a, on the other day we're going to be 10 o'clock nine minutes and 14 seconds for Telstra. Why is that important? Well from uh, from ASX point of view again this is not example from ASX point of view because there's so much information accumulated overnight. So since the yesterday is closed at 4 p.m. until the open this morning at 10 a.m., there are so many hours of, of information accumulated. So usually you will, see, uh, uh, you, will, you will see a lot of trading volumes at the start of the day. Because they want to people to better ma monitor their, better manage their portfolios, better manage their traded shares, that's why they, they do this uh, division open up uh, uh, steadily for uh, gradually for each group and plus or minus 15 seconds well there's no reason why that should be plus or minus 15 seconds rather than 12, 10 or 10 or, or 5 or you can start just sharp at 10 o'clock 9 a.m but the goal here is that they want to avoid uh, the last minute trade to alter the open price and all this is discussed in a um, third year unit finance 07 trading securities market that's one of the fun units in this uh, degree. Anyway, let's go back to what we need to uh, learn about share trading, share valuation. So here, how do we actually come up with a reasonable assumption for growth rate? You can read what I have over here, or you can follow me and doing a, a derivation. So we know that this is very important, I must say, very important, and I encourage you to do it with me together. So we know that we're assuming D1 equals to D0 times 1 plus G, because 1 plus G percent more than the previous dividend, the first dividend. 
So D1 here is the first dividend that we're gonna receive. And because it's growing at a constant rate G, so that means that it must be one plus G percent more than the current dividend, the one that we just, uh, one that we, we just paid. So this is observable, observed, right? Because you know what D0 is. All right, so if you rewrite it, so rewrite it, D1 over D0 equals one plus G, or G equals to D1 minus D0 over D0, which is D1 over D0 minus one. And that just means, so here, remember we're saying D dividend coming from earnings per share. Remember, D1 equals to earnings per share, earnings per share, EPS, times the dividend payout rate. That's, that's the definition, right? Because dividend coming from part of the earnings and it's determined by the, um, by the board of directors based on how, what's the percentage they decide to pay out from the EPS. So that means this formula can be rewritten as EPS one times dividend payout rate minus EPS zero times dividend payout rate. We are assuming, of course, we are assuming the, um, the, the dividend payout rate doesn't uh, the dividend payout rate does not change over over years. Over EPS zero times dividend payout rate, and you can think about well, here we have a common factor of dividend payout rate because we're assuming that the structure of that of that doesn't change. It's always a certain percentage of that payout from the earnings, so that becomes. the change in earnings from year one to from year zero to year one divided by the current earnings. And we're talking about this here is the current earnings, right? And where do you get a change in earnings? So how do you how does the firm in, um, get a new earnings? Well of earnings coming from new investment, the profit, I, the new, the additional profit that you make. So assuming that you are running on a very similar uh, business activities. So that means that the ch the increasing earnings were coming from new investment that the company make times the return on new investment divided by earnings. But where do we get new investment? The new investment coming from your investment that made by the company, of course. And how does that how how is that funded? What well, you fund it from your existing earnings times retention rate. Which in other words What's not paid out as dividend is retain the company to fund new investment times return on new investment divided by earnings. And that coming from here, right? Just want to draw a line to show how's that divided, how's that derived. So now, we have a common factors of earnings this year. You can cancel that out. So that can be written as retention rate times return on new investment. Remember here we're trying to derive a G, right? Trying to derive a G. And retention rate can also be written as one minus dividend payout rate, which means whatever is not payout as dividend will be retaining the company times return on new investment, R O I, or return on equity, just another name. R O I, 
ROE, return on equity, that's just the same thing. So here, we can think about G here is a, is a factor of retention rate times return on new investment, right? So whatever is not paid out as dividend, retain the company, that will fund new investment, which then contribute to the changing earnings, which then lead us to what we're starting from at the, at the beginning, is D1, right? So if you're not sure how that's derived, go back and rewatch that part again to think about how we arrive at the, at the bottom bit. Retention rate times return on new investment, or one minus DPR, which is one minus dividend payout ratio times new investment. So what does this derivation show us? It shows us that if the dividend payout rate or the retention rate, let's just make it over here. So the if dividend payout rate is the same, a constant, then the growth rate in dividends will equal to the growth rate of earnings and then will be equal to the retention rate, whatever is not paid out as dividend, times what you can get from new investment. All right, that's just looking at some uh, numerical examples and then we come back to examining the, the implications. I just say, your earnings per share in year one is gonna be $1 and your dividend payout rate is 100%. So which means here, the G is zero, YG is zero, because, let's write it down again, G equals to your retention rate times, times return on investment or one minus D P R times return on investment. So which means if dividend payout rate is 100%, the G is gonna be zero. Think about intuitively speaking, if you pay all profit out as dividend, there's no funding internally to fund new investment. If there's no new investment, there's no way for you to come up with the, the growth for the earnings. So which means the growth will be zero for the dividends, right? Holding everything else constant, not changing dividend payout, so in this case, given the share price $20, what is the RE? What is required rate of return for this equity? So D1 is $1. The price, current price is $20. That's something that you can observe. So D1 over RE, which means RE here equals to, there's no G, G is zero. RE here equals to $1 divided by $20, 5%. So which means your required rate of return is 5% in this assumed model, in, in this model. And let's, let's say, now if companies start paying, uh, start paying, start retaining some dividends, so they will change DPR to 60% and such that they can use that, the non-pay dividend, the retained profit, on funding some new investment. Let's just say the return on new investment is 5%. What is the share price? So here, G equals to one minus DPR times return on new investment. That's the formula. I want you to write that formula down somewhere. Very important. G equals to the retention rate times ROI, or equivalently, G equals to one minus dividend payout rate times return on new investment. So here, would the G equals, so the, would the DPR change to 60%? That means 40% is return, retained to fund new investment. And the new investment return is 5%. That just means the G here is 0 0.02. So given the share price is 60 cent, P0 equals to D1 divided by RE minus G, which is one, uh, which is, 60 cents because why the why d1 is 60 cents because the dpr is 60 percent that means only 60 percent of the earnings which is one dollar will be paid out as dividend so 0 0.6 divided by 0 0.05 minus 0 0.2 and the answer is still 20 dollars the price hasn't changed from the first scenario why no change 
We're going to come back to answering that question after seeing two more examples. And let's just say here we change the DPR to 60%. So that means we start re uh, retaining 40% profit, just like the previous scenario. But the return on new investment is 0.04. So what is the price? So G here equals to 1 minus DPR times the return on new investment, which is 0.016. So D1 here, 60 cents coming from 60% of $1 earning. And that becomes, using the formula, you get P0 equals to 17.65. Comparing to the initial share price, which is $20, you will say, okay, why does the share price drop? Why now the share price is 17.65? All right, we're going to ask one more question before we answer that, before answering previous questions. Okay, the third scenario is where the DPR is 60%. The return on your investment is 6%. So what is the price? So G equals to 1 minus DPR times return on new investment, which gives you a G of 2.4%. Given that D1 is going to be 60 cent, 60% 60 of the earnings $1. P0 equals to 0 0.6 divided by 0 0.05, because return on equity doesn't change. Sorry, a required rate of return on equity doesn't change. It's for always 5%. And minus 0 0.024 gives you $23.08. You can see the price rises. So what is four scenarios reveal to us is that, well, in the first, in the base case scenario, where here the company is not paying out 100% paying of dividends back to its shareholders. There's no growth to the company's uh, earnings. And, but as soon as they start retaining some profit to fund new project, dividend amount will drop but the growth rate will go up. The growth rate coming from, you know, uh, the return on new investment times the retention rate. But it only matters when this return on new investment you generate from, new, from the new investments exceeds what required from the shareholders, RE. So when RE equals the return on new investment, there's no change to the stock price. And when the return on new investment is lower than what expected by the shareholders, the share price actually drops. But when the return on new investment 6% is higher than what is expected from the shareholders at 5%, the share price increase. So which means the cutting the, div the firm's dividend to increase investment will rise the stock price if and only if the new investment have a positive MPV which means the return you generate from new investment is larger than what's expected from the shareholders. So you can see why, why we start from this dividend discount model, why we start from this very basic model, because it actually reveals a very important decision determined by the management, is that when do they actually start paying out dividends? So think about a new growing company, right? A company is at its early growth that they think they can do a better job than what the shareholders do with their money. So which means if they think that retaining the money in the company will generate 12%, where if they pay that back to the shareholders, the shareholder can only generate 8% on their own, then it's better off for them to keep it, keep it within the company, like what Google and Facebook does, and then, re, and then retain this profit and fund the new investment in-house. But once the company becomes mature, that, for example, like, Tels like uh, uh, Telstra, like they can't think of any uh, good investment to invest in because most markets they're operating are mature. So which means in this case, they think that it's better off to pay back to its shareholders and let shareholders to fund their own investments to make, to, to, uh, to generate additional growth. And that is what this uh, model reveals to us. So even though it's very, it looks very simple, looks very straightforward, in fact, looks very naive, but tells you a lot about the decision to pay dividends or to retain it and to fund internal growth. All right. So if you're not sure about this, just please rewatch it again because this probably does not seem sound intuitive for many people. All right. So we so think about the growth. Think about what we uh, the uh, you know the um, think about the dividend discount model that with constant growth. We know that we can't use the constant dividend 
uh, growth model to value a stock if the growth rate itself is not constant. Because, you know, like, like what we just said before, a young company often have very high initial earnings growth rate because there were, uh, there were a large enough market for them to penetrate through and their, uh, and their model is not mature yet. So you can think about during this period of high growth, these firms usually retain 100% of their earnings to exploit profitable investment opportunities. And once they start maturing, the growth slows just like Telstra. So which means that how can we come up with a better assumption? The one that more captures the, what happens in reality is that, well, we can start assuming the company will pay some dividends, may or may not. So it will pay some dividend, dividend one or dividend two or dividend three. So this not just in, in a symbolic form, dividend one can be zero, can be one dollar, dividend two can be zero, can be 5% more than previously, or it doesn't have to be. Or you can just it can just be zero as well, but until about n years later, the company now becomes a lot more mature, right? So they can, we can then start assuming that the dividend will start growing at g percent. So think about this timeline over here. You can think about well, given that the present value, uh, given that the price equals the present value of all this all this discounted value, so. P0 can be written as a sum of dividend 1 divided by 1 plus IE plus dividend 2 divided by 1 plus IE squared and to dividend N divided by 1 plus IE power to N plus, plus when after N years, the dividends start growing at a constant amount. So which means if you're looking at this, if you just looking at this, start, start after n periods. So starting from n plus 1, 1, 2, 3, that becomes a perpetuity with constant growth. Here, with the first dividend amount to be dividend n plus 1, the growth rate of g, and that means that part can be written as this formula over here, dividend n plus 1, because that's the first dividend in the dividend with constant growth, um, perpetuity with constant growth part, divided by r, i.e. minus g, but that formula itself gives you, gives you the present value at the start of this stream, which is over here, which is why that one needs to be further discounted back by M period, right? This is what we discussed in, um, in week four. If you're not sure about that, please go back to uh, the week four material to think about how you, what defines, what is an actual uh, perpetuity. So when you're using the present value of perpetuity with constant growth formula, it gives you the present value at the start of the stream, right? In this case, the stream starts from n, n plus one. So the present value of that, that formula will give you the present value at time n. But we care about time zero, which is why we need to discount that back by certain periods, All right? It looks complicated, but really it's not. Let's look at an example together. Frank is a small but growing app writer specializing in developing new iPhone apps. He does not expect to pay dividends for two years, though his earnings are growing rapidly, about 25% per annum, with current earnings of 50 cents per share. He expects to expect competition to increase considerably by year three during which it expects earnings to grow at just 3%, and this lower growth rate expects to continue into the future. So which means after that, the growth in earnings per share was just gonna be 3% per year. The company expected to start paying dividends at the end of the third year. So no dividends at the end of year one, no dividends at the end of year two, and a dividend payout ratio of 50% is predicted. The appropriate discount rate for this firm is 12% per annum. So what is the price of a franc share given these details? It's best to summarize everything in a table here. So let's just say, first of all, write out the earnings over the next three years, and then to calculate dividends and calculate the value of the stock by discounting the present value of dividends perpetuity starting at year three. So here, remember, dividends coming from earnings, right? So in year zero, we're not paying our dividends. 
but we don't care about year zero. In year one, we don't pay out any dividends. In year two, we don't pay out any dividends. For starting from year three, it's gonna be 50% of its earnings. But what, what are the earnings? So at the moment, if you're looking at what the question specified, what the example specifies, that the current earnings is 50 cents per share. It doesn't mean it's earnings at the end of year one. It means current earnings. That means that's earnings at time zero. And it's gonna grow in at 25% more than before. So which means by the end of year one, earnings gonna be 25% more than year zero, which is 0 0.5 times 1.25. And year two will again grow at 25% more than previously, which means year two will be 25% more than 0 0.625. But after that, given the competition uh, is toughened, so the, the earnings will only grow at 3%. So from year 3 onwards, it's going to be 3% more than the previous one. So which means year 3 is going to be 0 0.804688, 0 which is coming from 0 0.78125 times 1 plus 3%. And given the payout ratio is 50% constant, right? That's what we're assuming. So which means whatever that you're gonna get for, for the increase in earnings will translate that same amount into dividends. So which means if the earnings gonna grow at 3%, that means the dividends will also grow at 3% because the dividend payout ratio is the same. So in this case, we have because it's gonna start paying out constant dividend, I mean growing dividends from year three. So which means the dividend one here, the first amount dividend you're gonna receive is 0 0.402344 divided by IE, which is the required rate of ten of equity, 12%, minus growth rate, G, which is 3%. The 3% here, remember, coming from earnings, because earnings growing at 3%, earnings the profit, Profit can then redistribute it to shareholders through dividends, and given the fixed payout ratio, that means whatever grows in earnings will be the same amount, same growth rate for dividends, which is why the growth rate here is three percent. But this formula gives you what? Gives you the present value of the perpetuity with constant growth at the start of this uh, period, which is period two. If you're not sure. Let's just write it down. Zero, one, two. Hopefully by now you should be able to you should be able to work out that this is the first dividend. You get four, you get second dividend, and which is equals to D1 times one plus G. So which means if you use this formula, present value equals to D1 divided by R E minus G, it will give you the present value at the start of this period, of this streamline, of this uh, blue timeline, so which means it will give you the present value at time two. So which means in order to work out present value of time zero, you need to discount that back further by two periods. Right? Two periods, because that's the start. All right. So based on this information, the share price for Frank should be $3.56. Okay, so what are, what are the limitations of a dividend discount model? Well, there's a tre tremendous amount of uncertainty associated with forecasting a firm's dividend growth rate and future dividends. We have seen that we need to make assumption about the growth in earnings per share profit. We need to think about, we're gonna make an assumption about a payout ratio. We're gonna make an assumption on the return on new investment. And we are making an assumption after all that the, the dividend are actually growing. The growing, the growth rate actually doesn't change. So, you know, um, a small change in your assumed dividend growth rate, the G, can lead to large changes in your estimated stock price. And plus, a lot of companies that they actually do not pay dividends for a very, very, very long time. So the dividend discount model must be modified. So what goes on next is to think about 
an extension of our dividend discount model is to think about what if the company decides to pay out, to, uh, to buy its ba shares back. So remember, the way to increase dividends, one way to make uh, what we discussed before, one way to increase its dividends is to think about increase its earnings, increase the dividend payout rate, or it can decrease its number of shares outstanding. So which means that if the firm decide to repurchase shares from the market in the long term, that will decrease the outstanding shares, so which means in the long term, the profit generated back to each shareholder will be larger, even though the profit itself may not be larger, right? So a company can conduct share repurchases. By that, it means the company can use the cash to buy back its own share. But the difference between that and uh, paying out dividends is that share repurchases are determined, decided by the company's management, CEO, CFOs, but paying out dividends is determined by the board of directors. And why does the company want to buy, um, buy back its own shares? Well, think about it. Um, in real life, when you see a company buy back its own share, typically that is sending out a signal. It's, signaling, it's signifying that the management believes the share price is currently undervalued. It's undervalued such that that they if that if that even the management would think that the share is very attractive they buy back its own shares when when they think the share price is quite undervalued such that in the long term because of decreased number of outstanding shares they are able to pay back uh, their shareholders uh, more profit on a per shareholder basis but the more cash the firm uses to repurchase shares the less cash you would have available to pay dividends. So in the dividend discount model, we're valuing from a perspective of a single shareholder. So which means we're discounting the dividends that a shareholder will receive. Price equals the present value of the future dividends per share. In this extension, we're valuing from the total payout. So we value all of the firm's equity rather than the single share. So to use this model, we discount the total payout that a firm makes to shareholders, which is the total amount spent on both dividends and share repurchases. So which, which think about this, think about the shareholders in aggregate. Some shareholders, so shareholders, shareholders will receive dividends and, and some of the shareholders may, may sell the shares back to, um, to the company because through the repurchases. So which means the shareholders in total in aggregate, they get total dividends back as well as in the net purchases. And then you can think about if you divide it by shares outstanding at the moment, that gives you the share price. So this is the idea of the total payout model, which means that incorporates the, the, um, an activity by management, share repurchases, because that's also a cash flow back to, um, to, sh to shareholders. Let's look at this example. Titan Industries has 217 million shares outstanding and expect his earning at the end of the year to be $860 million. They plan to pay out 50% of his earnings in total. So 50% of the earnings will be paid out as dividends plus repurchases and the other 50% will be re retained to fund future growth. So in this case, if 30% of that is dividends and 20% is to repurchase shares and their earnings are expected to grow at 7.5% per year, and this payout rates remain constant, so which means every year they will pay out, uh, the, every year they will pay out 50% of that, of their earnings to buy back shares as well as pay out dividends. What is the share price? What is the share price? So here, Based on the equity cost of capital of 10% and expected earning growth at 7.5%, we can think about the total future payout to so the aggregate payout to, to its shareholders is a constant growth perpetuity, right? Because the earnings will grow at 7.5% and the equity cost is 10%. But the only input missing here is Titan's total payout this year. Do we know that? Well, the question told us. The example told us that it's going to be 50% of his earnings. 
So which means the present value of all Titan's future payouts is going to be the value of his total equity. So how do we obtain a share price then? We can then get a share price based on the total payouts divided by the number of shares outstanding. So in this case, the title the Titan will have total payout being $430 million, which is 50% of 860. Given that amount will grow by 10, by 7.5% and the discount rate is 10% using the perpetuity with constant growth formula, we'll get that to be $17.2 billion. So that means in terms of the present value of the total payout to shareholders as, as a group, that's going to be $17.2 billion. And that, given that, you know, at the moment we have about 217 million uh, share outstanding. On a per share basis, the share price, which share price always represents per share basis, is going to be $79.26. And that's the idea for using total payout model. So using the total payout method, we, we don't actually need to know the firm split between dividends and share repurchases. So in this case, we can make a comparison with what we learned in the dividend payout model. So in the dividend payout model, because the Titan is only, only paying out 30% dividends, so that means 30% of that, uh, so that means uh, they're going to receive $1.19 per share coming from 30% of the earnings divided by 217 million shares. And given the dividend yield, uh, given the share price is 79.26, we calculate from here. Oh, this one doesn't respond to me. So given that we calculate share price 79.26, we can calculate the dividend yield, which is 1.5%. So what we then have here, remember the growth rate plus the dividend yield gives you the total payout rate. So here, G here can be, uh, uh, G here is equal to required rate of return of equity minus the dividend yield, which is 10%. That's what's specified in the question, 10% minus 1.5%, which is 8.5%. And then for an acute student, you will know that in this case, they're specifying the growth rate to be 7.5% of the earnings. So why does the earning, why does the growth rate becomes 8.5% here from the shareholders point of view? And that's because the share count will decline over time because of the share repurchases. That means that on a per share basis, gradually um, the growth rate, so the, so the, so each shareholder will receive about 8.5% more in dividends compared to a 7.5% growth in just earnings because of the decreasing outstanding number of shares. All right, let's put it all together. So how would an invest investor decide whether to buy or sell a share? Well, they will value the share using their own expectation. So what we have assumed in this whole uh, lecture today is that we assume people uh, know that what the dividend one going to be, what the uh, share price one going to be. But you know that it's never going to be the case. We're just saying that's their own expectations. If their expectations were substantially different, they might conclude that the share is either over or underpriced. And based on that conclusion, they would then buy and sell the share according to the, uh, the calculation. So how could a share suddenly be worth more or less after an earnings announcement? Well, as investors digest the news, they will update their expectations. So let's say if the company announced that they have made 10% more earnings, that just means that's 10% more than what people already anticipated. And, trend, and then incorporate that into what's, what happens in our, in our um, dividend discount model. That just means with additional increase, with a surprising increase, with an unanticipated increase, that would change the share price. And so that if they, so, and then they will update their expectations and then they were buying and selling pressure will then drive the share price up or down until the buys and sells come into balance, right? So what should managers do to raise share price then? Well, the only way for, for the managers to raise share price is to make value increasing decisions. 
is to fund new investments that will generate a return higher than what the investors anticipate. So that relates to this discussion over here, if you recall that, um, which is relates to our example over here, that the only way for you to increase the share price is to fund new investment, which gives you a higher return than what is expected from the investors as RE. And that takes us to the next two weeks uh, topics, which is investment returns and capital budgeting. Is to think about how, as a as a uh, as a manager, that we can make value increasing decisions. All right. So next week, before uh, make sure that you have, re make sure you have registered your my finance lab. Um, it's not too too late to do so because you still have half of tasks to do if you haven't done so. And next week, you're going to talk about investment decision rules with Daniel Cahill. See you.